I like this song a lot, and I think it's going to play in the room. So we're going to listen to this together. We've, we've heard it before in a different version. I really like the longer non moan version, but this one's better because it's not so long. So we're going to listen and then type done.
when we look back over our lives, and the older we get, the more of our lives we have to look back over at, and we can remember the hard times, the really times when we thought we just weren't going to make it. Sometimes we might not have even wanted to make it, and yet God is faithful, even when we're not, and God is good. Even when we're not, and even when circumstances are not good, not to our liking at all. And when we can say, with true joy, all my life, you have been oh so faithful. And then we can sing of the goodness of God. And when we do that, we have hope for tomorrow. So, Father... As we gather together here tonight, I ask that you would be with us. Lord, wash away all the trauma from breaking the glass and getting the cut. And we ask for healing for Violinist Mother. Father, you know where each of us have cuts. And some of us have cuts in our hearts. Some of us have broken places in our minds. Places, memories that need healing or, or um, injuries that need healing. Father, some of us have um, hearts that need a tender touch. Some of us, Lord, need to be drawn into repentance and ask forgiveness for some of the things we may have done when we were operating outside of the goodness of God. So, Father, whatever we need tonight, I ask that you would gather us close. As Jesus said, comfort us. He longed to comfort Jerusalem as a mother hen gathers its chicks under her wings. Father, we come now and we rest in the shelter of the Most High. Be with us, guard us, guide us, and just let us receive from you all that you have from us, especially your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Very good verse. Thank you. So I was thinking... What do we want to do? What, show, what does God want us to ponder? What do I think God wants us to ponder? Because I'm not God. And um, I kept going back to, um, well, my area coordinator for the uh, ministry, the Billy Graham ministry, posted something uh, for us. She sent us something about to remember how much God loves you in the Father heart of God. And I thought, ooh, I remember the ABCs of the Father Heart of God. Maybe I'll do that. And then I thought, well, maybe not. And then I went back to it. So um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use that ABCs of the Father Heart of God, which is kind of a fun thing to do. Hey, Savon, welcome. Anybody else come in, lady? And Christ Walk, I saw you. Oh, Luana came in. Hi. So um, it's exciting. To get to know the one who has been oh so faithful all our lives. And it's exciting to get to know the one who has fathered us even before we were born. God was our Abba Father before we were born, before even one of our days came to be. And Psalm 139, 13 through 16 reminds us, speaking of God, the Father, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. You know, God is sovereign. God has held and will hold all the days of our life in his hand, in his sovereign will, and he's good. And life isn't good sometimes, but God is good. And that's a dichotomy. And we have to come to peace with that, that God is good. It doesn't matter how it seems. It doesn't matter what he said or she said or didn't say or they did or did not do. 
God is sovereign. God is loving. God is kind. God is slow to anger and abounding in love. And God is Emmanuel with us, even as this psalm reminds us before we were born. So with an open Bible, we can meditate or ponder on our awesome Father, the ultimate revelation of his heart for us and to us and in us and through us is found in the word. And this is kind of, you might think this is a little woo-woo, but it's not really. We can sort of let God reparent us. And we'll talk a bit more about that. We can sort of let the one who is holy, good, pure, and perfect, love. He's holy love. We can let him reparent us in his love so that we can see all that he does in our lives through the filter of his love. Not through our hurts, not through our wounds, not through anything else, but the truth of his love and his presence with us. First John says, uh, chapter 4, 16. says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Our Abba Father wants us, each of us, to know him, to love him, and to enjoy him. And he also wants us to reflect him. Like the moon has no light of its own, but boy, is a full moon beautiful. We reflect the light, the love, the joy, the peace, the hope that is found in Christ Jesus. And until we really know him, we can't reflect him. We can't love him. We can't enjoy him. We can't fully love him, and we can't show his love to others until... Our understanding is transformed by the renewing of our minds and our hearts. And until then, we can't and we don't fully trust him. And the reason is, we live on, a, on earth. Some of us had really good natural fathers. Some of us had not so good natural fathers. And some of us had no father at all growing up. But even those of us with the very best earthly dads have misconceptions about who God really is as our father. Because we have a picture in our mind. This is what fathers do because this is what my father did or my uncle or my grandfather or that teacher, that male teacher. All earthly dads are so much less than our perfect Abba father. So what we're going to do again, we did this about five years ago is we are going to look at the ABCs of the Father Heart of God towards us. And then we will ponder the verses suggested. And as we go through the characteristics of the nature of our Abba Father, you may think of a verse or an example to share. Remember, keep it in ABC order of the letters we are discussing. Like this week, we're going to be talking about A, attributes of Father of Jesus, or Father God. Let's sing our father. Let's start with A. And the first one from my source is, it's a couplet. A, my father is my Abba, Father God, and I and you are his beloved child. You are loved. Oh, you are so loved. Imperfections and all. Romans 8, 15 and 16 tells us, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you, we, have received the spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself 
bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. This is one of my favorite verses. What a verse of comfort and hope. I love the term Abba. That's the Aramaic word for daddy. And at first, it might feel kind of weird to address God, a holy, righteous, sovereign, fearful, awesome, powerful God as Abba. It's kind of familiar, and yet that's exactly what that scripture invites us to do. To come as children, of, come to our Abba Father. I want to slip over for just a minute to 1 Corinthians 13. where love is described. And we're going to read verses 4 through 8a. And they describe love. And they say, it says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and look, love never ends. God is love. So that passage tells us what he's like towards us. You can look up that whole passage in context and you can change love to God. God is patient. God is kind. We've done that before and you can do that on your own time. And that may be difficult to hear for some of us because perhaps that was not the sort of love you had when you were growing up. Most people experienced at the very best love that was way more conditional. We were pleasing when we got good grades, but we were not so pleasing if we brought home an F. We were pleasing when we told the truth and did everything right, but we got that frown of disapproval. And sometimes we got anger at us. God, as our Abba Father, loves us like 1 Corinthians 13. It said, it doesn't say, I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying that God loves us to sin. Because it says, if you change it to God, God does not rejoice at wrongdoing. But he doesn't rejoice at that. So, God is our Abba loves us this way. And then we, as sons and daughters, as children... Beloved and cherished children can relax in the safety of belonging to Abba. And um, before I go on with my story, I want to tell you, remember when we were talking the last two weeks about condemnation and conviction and the difference and condemnation makes us go hide from the loving Father God and conviction draws us to him in repentance? Do you see where that would fit? We are beloved and cherished children, and we can relax in the safety of belonging to Abba, even when, not, not giving us permission to sin, but even when we do sin, because we will, if we don't sin in any other way, we're going to sin in thought, in our thought life. I mean, we're going to want to, you know, somebody might make us mad or cut us off in traffic, and we'd really like to, you know, do something back to them, but... We take that thought captive, hopefully, and we don't do it, but we still sin. We still wanted to, or we wanted to. We did. But we can still go to God. Um, and God, the Father Almighty, reminds us that we call him Abba, that term of endearment. And that comes along with that comes access to him. A pastor I know in town a long time ago, Pastor Daniel Williams, told us that um, he went to Israel and he went to the uh, airport in Tel Aviv or somewhere. And when he got off the plane, there was this man that had been on the plane the whole time, a very stern man, a very, you know, those stiff, formal people. And he was, he was um, an Israeli man. He had on the, he was a Muslim man, actually. And he got off the airplane and this little kid burst loose from his mother and ran to this man. 
yelling, Abba, 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 Abba. He was so glad to see his daddy was home. He didn't see a stern man. He didn't see a Muslim. He saw his Abba. I wish that I could always see God like my Abba like that. And that's what Abba means. And we're going to look at a few other verses that mention the term Abba. One of them is in Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, at the right time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir through God. What I think that partly means is when it says no longer a slave, it means we are no longer bound or enslaved to our sin nature. We are born again. We are a new creation. We are set free to be sons and daughters and heirs of God Almighty. He's our Alpha Father. And another time it's mentioned is in John. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Remember the psalm we started with, 139? Born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, a child of God. A beloved child of God. How many of you feel safe to call God Abba all the time? Anybody gotten to that place? I do too, but it took a while. It took a while. It took a lot of study, a lot of heart transformation for me to be able to trust God with myself because I know what a messed up person I am. But yet we see over and over, he invites us to do that, to come to him, trusting. And Jesus said, let the children come unto me. If you do not come as or like a child, you have no part of him. And here's another one. It's different, but it's the same. And it's in James 1, 8, 1, 16 through 18. It says, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be kind, become, be a kind of fresh first fruits of his creation. When we heard and received the word, Jesus, the truth that we are indeed in need of the Savior, we got an identity change. And now... I want you to go back to an older study. It's by the same author with some other A, attributes of God. These are written in couplet form because God is X, then I am Y. And the first couplet we already did, but in a different way. And it said, God is Abba Father, therefore I am God's child. The next one says, this is a good one. Jesus is our advocate. It's in 1 John. And because Jesus is our advocate, I know that God is for me. He's on my side. He's defending us. Because Jesus and God are one. There's one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The first couplet shared a verse. This one does not. 
in the first one, it was the same verse for both. Romans 8, 15 through 16. God is Abba and we are Abba's child. But this one has two different verses. We're going to look at each one separately. But we're going to remember that they have application for our lives together. The verses together. First John says, First John is such a lovely book. My little children. Ha, huh, look. The, but he's, that's Paul. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but for those of the whole world. Notice in this verse that advocate is in capital letters. That is because it refers to Jesus. And in the New Living, which I don't use often, but it's, it's pretty cool. New Living Translation explains verse 2 better. And it says, My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus the Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. When we sin, and this is so hard to understand, but it's so true. Somebody's got a mic open. I hear it clicking. When my mom and me were downsizing our basement one time, which we try to do every Saturday, we found my dad's Bible, and it had a ton of handwritten notes in it. What a gift. Did you keep it? Hey, football girl, welcome. When we sin, God is the righteous judge. But at the same time, we go before the judge with the judge himself defending us on our side and not just on our side as the one who has already paid the penalty, the fine, for our sin. It cannot get any better than that. That's cool, violinist. A gift from your Abba Father, right? Both. Abba Father, because the word is his gift to us, and from your father, your daddy, because he loved it. And because Jesus is our advocate, we know that God is for us. And Romans 8.31 says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us. Who can be against us? And he is for us, isn't he? On our side, totally. This is a wonderful verse. Later, it goes on to elaborate what exactly has no power to be against us. But let's ponder some other verses from Romans 8. Let's just look at them. First, we're going to look at verse 1. And actually wrote part of this during church Sunday. Verse 1 of Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Remember, born again, new spirit, new nature. I will put my spirit in you, and you will be my." We discussed this in depth last week and the week before. The difference between condemnation and conviction is huge. Sin is sin. We're not going to whitewash it. When we sin, we are to repent, and to repent implies turn back and turn away from the sin. Sunday at church, I was doodling on the bulletin during the sermon, and I wrote this. He was talking about sin, actually. I wrote, recognize it, repent of it, return to God, receive his forgiveness, and find renewal. Be made new. Isn't that cool? Recognize, repent, return, receive, and be renewed. And also in Romans 8, we don't cover our sin up. We don't hide it and we don't deny it. Remember David in Psalms when he said against, I think it was David, whoever it was, it said, against thee and thee only have high sin and done what is unrighteous in your sight when they were repenting. In verse 28, 
reminds us again, and we know, Psalm 51, thank you, that all things work together to good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I thought it was David, but I wasn't 100% because I didn't look it up. So which things work for our good? Only things we like or prefer? Um, only when we feel good, only when we don't stump our toe or break our mother, or when our mother doesn't break the measuring cup in the sink and make a god awful mess with little bits of glass. Or all the time, all things work together for good. This includes difficult things, things we do not understand as well. Because after all, she didn't have to go get stitches, or not yet, hopefully never. And then Romans 8, verses 35 and 37 and 38 says, <laughs> Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember the song, All my days you have been faithful. You are so, so good. All my life you have been faithful. And Dodie note. And you know when that, I don't really like that part that I like it, but I don't like it where it says, I'm running, running, running to you. But that's what we do when we repent. We run to God. We say, I'm sorry, I messed up. Fix me. Help me. What can separate us from the love of our Abba, Father? Nothing. Not one thing. Not angels. Not devils. Not presidents. Not our past. Not whatever is going on right now that we don't like or that we do like. Not what might happen in the future. Nothing at all. And not even our own doubts can separate us from the love of God. It may cause us to be unaware of his love. But the love of God is constant. Isn't that good to remember? Yeah, or COVID, like that little smiley said. Probably. Quorum Deo could probably find us a song with that. Or you might good. Or psalmist, anybody. The next couplet. In the A's, God is all-knowing. That's in John 16, 30 and 21, 17. And because God is all-knowing, I live peacefully, securely, and undisturbed, no matter what. Because remember, nothing's going to separate us from the love of God. And remember the song. Wasn't that like a perfect song for these little ponderings? He is all-knowing. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Because God knows all things. We can be assured that he is all-knowing and knows just what we need. Even better than what we think we want or need. And the other verse. John 12. 21, 17 says, he said to him the third time, remember this, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And this is that famous passage. I love this passage. Do I say that a lot? where Jesus is restoring Peter after his resurrection. Remember, before Jesus went to the cross, he told Peter you would deny him three times, and Peter said, no, never, I'll never, and then he did deny him three times. Uh, Peter, who had denied Jesus three times, was lovingly given a chance 
to affirm his love three times. And he realizes afresh and reminds us that the Lord knows all things. Sometimes Sometimes I like to remember when I cannot even understand why I think the thoughts or the wonderings I do that God does understand. See, when difficult things happened in my life and in yours, God was there. God has been aware of us ever since before he knit us in the womb. So God knows the things that led us to being the quirky people we are. And his desire is always, I believe, always to touch, to heal, and to restore. For me, that helps me be a little less hard on myself when I feel like I can't get it right or when somebody's displeased with me, especially if they're displeased with me unjustly. <laughs> God, who is all-seeing and all-knowing and all-loving, understands me, and he understands you too. Sort of like... If a little kid is tired and cranky, I, as an adult, understand that they are not being bad, but they're having a meltdown because they're children and they're tired. We are his children. We are his kids. And he, I believe that he understands if and when we have a meltdown, which doesn't negate that we need to repent if we do something bad. And because God, therefore, we can live peacefully, securely, and undisturbed, which Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Don't you love that promise? I do. And there's another one that says he sets our boundaries in pleasant places. Let's thank our Abba. Abba Father, thank you for sending Jesus so that we can live in a peaceful place, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, so that we can live in a secure dwelling and that we can always enter quiet resting places just by remembering that you are our Abba and we belong to you. I have a few more, but they're not long. Isn't this stuff good to remember? Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Revelation 1 8 says, 1 8 says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Abba God, the Lord, has always existed. He will always exist. And so we have a safe rock to run to when life is difficult. Because God is, or Jesus or God is the Alpha and the Omega, we are being completed in Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, in us, will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I, I like to think of it this way as I was pondering this. We are not expected to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and get it right. We may expect that of ourselves, or we may have been told that in the past. That little voice in our head, remember we talked about those a few weeks ago? But what God implies here is a resting trust. He implies that a resting trust is what is needed. And it says that he, God, who began a good work in us, will finish it. You and I are good works. We're not good, but we are good work by God. And we are in process. Isn't that nice? And because he is the Ancient of Days, which is pretty much saying he's always been, we are not our own. We belong to God. 
we don't get to pick what we want. When we pray in Jesus' name, we don't we don't say, God, I want that Ferrari over there. In Jesus' name, I'll have that Ferrari over there. Maybe Jesus doesn't want to give us that Ferrari. That's not that that's not in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name is praying according to his will. So Daniel 7 9 says, I watched until thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. And for us tonight, what we're taking from that is that the Ancient of Days, the one who created it all, the one who has always been and always will be, is the same one who earlier we read invites us to call him and relate to him as Abba, Father. Therefore, I am not my own. First Corinthians six nineteen and 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Dodie note, the price by which we were purchased was Calvary. One way to live that way is found in a verse I love, and it's a verse of instruction in Jeremiah 6.16. 6, and it says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look. And ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. How sad that people back then did not do that. And how sad for some of our leaders who do not do that. But wait, how sad if and when we choose not to walk God's way. The culture should not dictate to us or model for us what is acceptable, God-pleasing behavior. But the ancient ways, the biblical truth can and does. And we all have access to it, and it's called the Bible. I think there's two more. If you have to go, you can go and violinist after these two, then please, will you be playing for us? The next one is Jesus is the anointed one, and therefore we are anointed by God. Jesus is the anointed one, Psalm 2, 2. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In other words, let's don't obey God. Let's walk away. And of course, that does not work well for them, does it? <laughs> it doesn't work well for us either. But we are anointed. Because 1 John says, But the anointing which you have received from him, capital H, abides in you. And you do not need anyone that anyone teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Talking about the indwelling Holy Spirit. I like this. I find it assuring. We or I can abide in him. He is the anointed one. And he has endured and he has remained the one after each one who opposed him was long gone. All those rulers and all those kings and all those people down through the centuries that opposed God are long gone and we know where they are too. And the same one, the same one invites us to call him Abba. And that is referring to the indwelling Holy Spirit, I believe. And because he has all authority, then we, being under him, 
and protected by him have authority to overcome. Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus spoke to them and said, All authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Do we see any exception clause here, such as God has all authority except? I don't see any exceptions. All authority was given to Jesus on earth and in heaven. And therefore, we have authority to overcome because Luke ten nineteen says, Jesus said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And isn't it neat that Jesus, who has all authority, has delegated the same to us? Sometimes we forget all that, or I do, and we feel like I am at the whim of whatever comes at me. But Jesus said vastly different, didn't he? He said, we have all authority over all the power of the enemy, and it will not hurt us. It won't kill us. Let's remember to remind one another of this whenever we forget. And the last one is maybe, except for the Ava part, is the most important. <sighs> this is something that you can practice. And once you hear it, you can't unhear it. He's our Avenger. In Psalms 1847, and therefore we manifest God's purposes to rulers and authorities, Ephesians 3 10 through 12. He is our avenger, and Psalm 1847 says, It is God who avenges me and subdues the peoples under me. Once we really grasp this, life changes. When we are wronged, when we are spoken ill of, we don't have to fix it. We don't have to explain it either. We don't have to defend ourselves. All we have to do is take our hurt to God and choose to forgive the one who did whatever it was they did. And then we sit back and watch God avenge us. And you know what? He will. I promise you, he will. In fact, you'll be praying for those people for, for God to have mercy on them. I have learned over the years to practice this. I have done it at work when falsely accused one time and I watched God fix it. That time, in order to be with God to let him deal with the hurt and betrayal, I actually had to take a day off and get out of the environment. And when I returned, it was as if the thing had never happened and the person who accused me wrongly was dealt with and I never did anything at all except forgive them. And since then, I have done that many times and found that God takes really, really, really good care of us when we entrust all that, whatever it is, to him. And the second part of the couplet, and this is the very end of Violinus, uh, Psalmist found this verse, yeah, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all, if possible. So far as it depends on you, I love that part. Live peacefully with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Yeah. But leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by, doing, by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I want to tell you, if you don't know what burning coals are, I used to think of that verse as saying, well, I was really, I was really, well, anyhow, I was mad at somebody for a long time, years and years ago. And I read that burning coal verse and I thought, oh, goody, I'll forgive them and God will put burning coals on their head and that'll teach them a lesson. Well, then I found out what burning coals really was. It's a gift. One of the when, when the Israelites were encamped in the wilderness, they needed fires to cook on, and it was the job of one in the, one of the people who actually was a servant to have this thing on his head, and he went around and he kept a fire going all night, and then he would pick up the embers. And his job, or the burning coals, his job was to take 
the burning coals and give each little group a burning coal. So he heaped them on his head, which is where he carried them somehow on something that didn't burn him. And then he gave them to him. So he was blessing people and he had that job. I always thought that was funny once I realized it. And the second part of that couplet is, I manifest God's purpose to rulers and authorities. Ephesians 3, 10 through 12 says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Our task is to trust, lean, and rely on God, on our Abba, to come before him openly and with confidence that indeed God is our safety and our defender. So Lord, we thank you that you invite us to come as children, love children, welcome children, children who don't get it right all the time, but who have a father who will help them, who will teach them, who will correct them when necessary, and who will always, always love us. Thank you, Lord, that you have been with us and wanted us and cared for us and planned for us since before we were born, and that you have continued all the days of our lives, and you will never stop. So, Father, let us come with confident grace and rest tonight, secure in your love. We bless you. And we thank you. And I want to thank you especially for each person here and ask that you touch, heal, and restore all of us in the area of our deepest need, whether it's physical, emotional, or spiritual. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, it's violinist's turn. I think we'll enjoy this. I know I'm going to enjoy it. And I hope you will, too. And now I'm going to get my instrument. And now um, I'm also going to get my hymnals so I can play the hymns for you. Thank you. 